We should probably do some sort of introduction. Like, hi, everybody. I'm Patricia. Hi, I'm Lee. <laughs> <laughs> and we're weird as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you probably should, I guess. So. Yeah. Because someday we might be famous. <laughs> 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 okay. So. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Am I registering? I can't see. Yep. I don't see. Oh, you can't see it already. It's it's going very slowly. I don't see any squiggly lines anywhere. I'm gonna zoom in so we can see the squigglies. Squiggly lines. It makes me nervous when there are no squigglies. Anal probe. Actually, yes, we're talking about the anal probes today. Are you excited? Yep. yep. <laughs> It's just because I like saying anal probe. <laughs> <laughs> and now we've lost all our listeners. <laughs> Everybody's gone. But we'll keep talking. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, anal probing. How on earth did that become part of the whole UFO phenomenon? Because somebody... Uh came up with it and everybody followed like sheep after that i guess you know and it's interesting because that's pretty much exactly what it is is that alien abduction stories follow a certain pattern and when something new is introduced people who have had claims of alien abductions come back with oh wait 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 that was me too and it's 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 really interesting to me how those stories change now I'm not saying that alien abductions happen. I'm not saying that they don't. It's never happened to me that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope you'd know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. You'd think an advanced species, if they were actually studying us, that they'd have a way of make sh making sure that we weren't wise to it. Then we could put ourselves on a guard against it and maybe make it difficult for them to conduct their experiments. Maybe they don't give a fuck and they ain't worried about it. Or maybe that. I don't know. I mean, I can't imagine what about us is so interesting. Or, you know, mm -hmm. even more, what about our butts is so interesting. But unless they're just... <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're studying our digestive system. Our eating habits? I don't know. I don't know. But there is actually a pattern. There's there's a reason. There's a series of stories that kind of lead us down that dark path, if you will. The anal path. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you are not allowed to pick the topics anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> okay, so stories of close encounters with UFOs have been a part of American culture for a very long time. Um, they became popular in the 1940s, shortly before the end of World War II. Um, and some of the first alien experiences were reported actually in Washington State, so over Mount Rainier. That was the first time that a pilot reported seeing what he described as flying saucers in the air. That's where we get the term from. So Washington State was ground zero for the alien phenomenon in the United States in the 1940s. Of course. Of course, because, you know, <laughs> us. Oregon or Washington, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be us. It's not anything to do with us being among the first of the nation to legalize marijuana. That had nothing to do with it. We weren't the first, though. We were among the first. Yeah. Except I'm a truck driver, so I can't. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> uh, that's all we need. You kick back on the couch, munching out on Fritos all weekend. Okay. Where were we? All right. Ain't no pro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
The idea, though, of aliens actually coming to Earth and doing more than just flying around, but actually taking people into their craft for study, didn't emerge until the 1960s. Um, it's interesting to note, though, that stories of fairies and the fair folk have been around for thousands of years. And there are a lot of similarities between those stories and stories of alien abductions. And we'll cover that at some point later on. Fairies. Fairies. Fight the fairies. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it wasn't until 1961 when Betty and Barney Hill were abducted or reportedly were abducted in New Hampshire that we really started to see stories of modern people claiming that they were actually taken inside craft for the purposes of study by aliens. So Betty and Barney were driving through rural New Hampshire in 1961, and they claimed that they saw something in the sky. And being highly intelligent people, they stopped the car and got out to see what it was. <laughs> now, if it were me, I would have stopped the car, pulled a Huey, and gone the other way. I'm not going to stick around to see what's going on. Can't take a couple pictures, then take off. You know what? There's a reason why I would never be the hero of an adventure novel. They always run into danger. I'm not stupid. Fuck it. I'm going home. It's safe here. I choose life. Um, so Barney stepped out of the vehicle with a pair of binoculars. It doesn't say why Barney had binoculars in the car at night to use, but okay. Um and he claimed what he saw was a pancake-like craft descending to approximately where their vehicle had stopped along a scenic mountain road. Um, in it, he said he saw through windows on the deck. So if you can imagine the Starship Enterprise, and they have those bizarre windows that you can see out, which make no sense in an interstellar spacecraft, but... We're going to let that go. Why wouldn't you want windows in your spacecraft? Why would you need windows in your spacecraft? You would, would, wouldn't you prefer structural integrity for the long haul? Well, if they got something that's designed just as just strong, okay. why not have windows? Maybe, but we're talking about alien creatures looking out the window at Barney. Wouldn't hey, they be using... Look like, huh? <laughs> hey, look at that. <laughs> look at that man down there um i don't know what accent that was just let it go um but yeah there uh, it would make more sense to me to use a camera system so they could zoom in and get a clearer view of whatever creature they were targeting as opposed to waving from the deck saying you know hey stay right there we'll be right down which is essentially what barney said they told him to do they spoke to him telepathically and said <laughs> hold up we're coming down, which, okay. So Barney at this point came to his senses and decided he was going to nope right out of that situation. He hops back into the car and takes off, speeding away back down the mountain road they traveled. Unfortunately, the craft was faster than his little car was, and they caught up to them. Um. According to Barney, he heard something hitting the back end of his car, and there were marks on the back of his vehicle that looked as though it had been grabbed by perhaps a magnet. So if you can imagine the magnets that they have at wrecking yards that they use to pick up the vehicles and put them on the crushers, mm -hmm. something similar to that. Um, but he only vaguely remembered that happening, the magnets hitting the back of his vehicle and um, slowing his vehicle. He didn't really remember what happened next until later. Um, when they came to again, because this whole experience rendered them rather insensible, um, they'd made it 35 miles down the road. And they had absolutely no memory of driving at all. So 35 miles down a windy mountain road in New Hampshire. That's a long way to go in some rather hazardous, a rather hazardous situation. In the 1960s, the roads weren't terribly well lit back then. So it's not really something that you can do by feel. No, there's no way you could go that far and not see where you're going. But they picked the car up, so... Well, did they pick the car up or did they just guide else. the car? Or what did they do? <laughs> Barney isn't entirely sure. 
for the rest of his life, he wasn't sure. Um, it would be several weeks of nightmares, daytime flashbacks, and finally hypnotherapy before he'd have a clearer, if somewhat contradictory, description of what happened to he and his wife on the ship. Um, his account is slightly different than Betty's, but what they both do agree upon is that they were taken into the ship and they were poked and prodded, much like he would be at the doctor's office. Samples were taken. Um, Betty claims that a sample of her dress was taken, like they cut a piece of the fabric. That doesn't make any sense. Well, I mean, it does fabric. if it's something that they hadn't seen before. I guess. We're primitive. Um, Barney's account is perhaps the first that we ever see of an alien anal probe entering... <laughs> And, you know, to his, to his credit, it was, it, it doesn't sound like it was something funny at all. It sounds kind of mortifying. So he stated that the probe was inserted into a, inserted into his rectum and used to exit. How do I say this nicely on a podcast? Um, <laughs> it's, you know, you know how they ejaculate bulls when they're collect collecting sperm for... Yeah, they shock them in the butt. Yeah, Barney says that's pretty much what they did to him. And he didn't enjoy it. Now, the interesting thing about it, though, is that Barney's account wasn't published until years after his death. They they respected his dignity and they decided that that wasn't something that the general public needed to, to hear. Um, it was the 1960s. I mean, people were a little bit more... Uh oh. No, it's fine. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> I free it. Um, so that's the first time that we hear about anal probes and aliens in the same in the same story. Um, but we didn't hear about that until the eighties eighties or nineties. Um in nineteen seventy three two workers, Charlie Hickson and Calvin Parker, were fishing along the Pasco. Pascagoula River in Mississippi. Sorry. Well, it is kind of a tongue twister. It is a tongue twister. Um, so they were fishing where they weren't supposed to be, probably without a license. Um, Charlie was an older gentleman. And Calvin was 19. Pretty quiet kid. Um, and they went down to the river where they weren't supposed to be without a license. Um, and they heard a whizzing noise and looked up and saw flashing blue lights. And they thought that they were in trouble because, like I said, they weren't supposed to be there. Um, so they grabbed their stuff and they turned to one another trying to figure out, okay, what do we say when they come and they arrest us for poaching or try to give us a citation? Um, when they noticed that the lights weren't attached to a vehicle, they were attached to a large oval-shaped craft that they described as being 30 to 40 feet across and 8 to 10 feet high. And it contained several humanoid-like creatures who paralyzed them and forced them conscious and helpless onto the craft. So it levitated them from where they were standing onto the craft. Um, while in captivity, they said they were forced to endure the same sort of thorough examination that Betty and Barney Hill were ex exposed to. And according to some accounts, this included an invasive anal probing. Obviously, again, the 1970s, Mississippi, this was not something that you went home and bragged to your buddies about. Yeah, you didn't talk about anal probing and, and back then. No. I don't think that I'd probably bring it up in casual conversation <laughs> now. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about that. Hey, y'all, what'd you do this weekend? I got probed. Um, yeah, I wouldn't tell my friends, much less my coworkers. By their estimates, the whole encounter only lasted for about 20 minutes, and they were levitated back out of the craft and placed onto the pier where they'd been fishing. Now, nobody else saw this, not even the bridge master, who was within viewing distance of them. But after the effects of the paralytic wore off, the two raced to the police station to report what had happened to them because they'd been abducted by some crazy, strange craft and they were afraid that they were being invaded by aliens and somebody needed to know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know. If you run and talk about that to the police, and then they just laugh at you and 
Hell yeah, idiot. Well, here's the thing. Obviously, 73, Mississippi, the police were probably pretty darn skeptical. They thought these guys had been drinking too much. They were probably, you know, not real bright. Who comes and tells the police something like this? So what they decided to do was put them in an interrogation room. Um, and they put a recorder in the desk drawer in the room and left them alone for a little bit. And what they recorded really surprised them. These guys were terrified, absolutely terrified. And I'm going to quote this. There's a little snippet that I found online of the actual conversation that the two had when they didn't realize they were being recorded. Um, so it starts off Calvin, the 19 year old said, I got to get home and get to bed or get some nerve pills or see the doctor or something. I can't stand it. I'm about to go half crazy. Charlie responds, I tell you, when we're through, I'll get you something to settle you down so you can get some, some damn sleep. Calvin responds, I can't sleep yet like it is. I'm just damn near crazy. Charlie says, well, Calvin, when they brought you out, when they brought me out of that thing, God damn it, like I never in hell got you straightened out. My damn arms, my arms, I remember they just froze up and I couldn't move, just like I stepped on a, on a damned rattlesnake. They didn't do me that way. Calvin says, I passed out. I expect I never passed out in my whole life. Charlie responds, I've never seen nothing like that before in my life. You can't make people believe. Calvin says, I don't want to keep sitting here. I want to see a doctor. And then they go on. These guys were absolutely petrified of what they'd seen and what had been done to them. And they keep saying, no one's going to believe me. Oh, God, it's awful. Where did they come from? Um, one of the one of the lines that really caught my attention was Charlie responding. I knew all along there was people from other worlds up there. I knew all along. I never thought it would happen to me. So whether or not this actually happened is, of course, up to for debate, unless it happens to Neil deGrasse Tyson on primetime recorded live for your amusement, nobody's ever going to believe that something like this is happening. But these guys absolutely believed and throughout their entire lives continued to believe that this happened to them. And that convinced, convinced the sheriff that whether or not he thought it was true, he absolutely believed that they did. Yeah, if you're recording in a room and there's nobody in there but them, I mean, they would be talking about how they're going to have the same story and all that kind of shit. And Exactly. And that's what the police thought that they were going to get was um, just an episode of these guys trying to get their story straight and making fun of the cops and... You know, talking about how they were trying to get out of the, the ticket or, or whatever. But throughout the entire recording, they're talking about what just happened to them, how they were paralyzed, how frightened they were, how strange the situation was. Calvin just wants to go home. Um, so Charlie leaned into this pretty hard. He talked about this his entire life. And he even went on the circuit where he was talking about it to audiences. Um, he sold his story. Um, he never made a ton of money off of it. In fact, later in his life, before he passed away, Calvin actually would come in sometimes and help him with his bills. Calvin um, remained mum until recently. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want anything to do with it. He never denied it happened. He just denied he remembered it. And, okay. and Charlie kind of went along with that. He knew that Calvin wanted to just have a normal life. He was engaged to be married. He was trying to get things going and being the guy that was abducted by aliens was not conducive to having a normal life in Mississippi in 1973 no. or now. I mean, that doesn't play out well for most people. So, they wouldn't even be the most famous case, though. And by no means are they the last. The most ca famous case and the one that most people, I think, began associated, associating aliens and anal probes happened in 1987. Science fiction author Whitley Strieber um, claimed to have been abducted from his home in... Are you okay? <clears throat> 
Hey, it's really sleepy. <laughs> you look really tired. Am I boring you? No, I just once I sat down and it's because it's really warm in here. It's I very cozy. So for shit. So back to the show. Back to the alien. <laughs> okay. So let me back up a little bit. So perhaps the most famous case came in 1987 when Whitley Streeper told the horrifying details of his own abduction in a book called Communion. In it, he describes being pulled from the safety of his own home and forced into a craft where who people he recalls visitors forced a device into his body. Um, he assumes to collect samples, but he describes it this way. Two of the stocky ones drew my legs apart. They inserted this thing into my rectum. It seemed to swarm into me as if it had a life of its own. Apparently, its purpose was to take samples, possibly of fecal matter. But at the time, I had the impression of being raped. And for the first time, I felt angry. In his account, Strieber, Strieber documents meeting with a variety of creatures of different shapes, sizes, and conformations. And perhaps for the first time, details the true emotional cost that abductees claim they face. Now, we've all heard stories of people being abducted by aliens. And usually these folks are ostracized by their communities. It's not something that people, you know, lean into and say, you know, hey, I heard you were abducted by aliens. Tell me all about it. How exciting. You know, what was it like? People usually look at them like they're completely off their nut. They don't want to know you. They don't want to talk to you. They assume that you're probably smoking something. <laughs> I'd say, hey, I want to, I want to hear it. <laughs> I would want to hear it, but I mean, really, don't most of us for, form kind of an opinion of people who claim that these things have happened to them? Well, it depends on the person that's talking to you. I mean, somebody I know for twenty years or something, and they're talking about it. I'm gonna. Probably, you know, believe what they're saying. They're not going to lie about something like that. Yeah, I think it really does depend on the person. But, you know, I've seen some of the people who come out and speak publicly about being abducted. And it's really, really hard to get behind some of those stories because they're just so outrageous. But I would imagine the PTSD that comes along with something like this would probably make your behavior sort of outrageous. Um, he refers to communion as a memoir. He claims that it really happened and it's an episode in his life that he wanted to document and being a professional writer, it was something that he was able to document well, but being a professional writer, it also made it more difficult for people to believe him. Yeah. It's sort of a double edge. For his 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. And it, you know, it actually became one of his more famous works. So I guess he got it. Now, Barney Hill passed away in 1969, the first gentleman that we were talking about. And he never publicly talked about the whole anal probing. Like I said, for obvious reasons, back in those days, you just didn't. And one of the more unusual things about Betty and Barney Hill for the 1960s is that they were an interracial couple, which was, I think, what made it more remarkable that they spoke out about their alien abduction. Because the idea of, you know, during the civil rights movement, movement, it was it was not safe to be an interracial couple in America. Yeah, I was kind of surprised that it was such a famous kind of story back then because everybody was so racist and against couples like that, that you'd think they would have shoved it under the carpet and not even got out into the public about it. Which to me is one thing that really brings a little bit more credibility to their story is that it wasn't in their best interest to draw attention to themselves. It's the last thing you want back then. Well, I, you know, even and now pretty much. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to paint the 1960s as being, you know, violently racist, but there were certainly parts of the country that were. And so you know, for them to put themselves out there like that, to me, I think blends even more credence to the story. Um, the same thing with the gentleman in Mississippi. Yes, one of them did lean in hard to the story and try to profit off of it. The other one did not. 
And it wasn't until recently that he was even willing to come forward and really talk about it publicly. Yeah, personally, I wouldn't want to talk about it. Not in public. So it was like, meh. Yeah. So for me, the folks that, you know, come out and say, this happened to me and, you know, go on the History Channel. And there was a case. um, I should know the man's name. It's pretty famous. Um, He was he claims to have been abducted in Arizona in the 1970s as well and was gone for a while. Travis Walton is his name. There it goes. I knew it was in there somewhere. <laughs> um, he leaned in pretty hard. He There was a book. There was a movie. Um, he actually profited pretty good off of it. Um, and yes, he was, of course, ostracized by his community as well. Stories like that, for me, are more difficult to accept. Whitley Strieber's, even maybe a little bit, just because he was able to profit off of the story. But stories like Barney Hill's, um, to me are more believable because these are earnest people who are making claims that they're trying to prove. They're trying to understand what happened to them. And they're trying to deal with the stigma of not only being an alien abductee, but being violated in such a way that if you're exposed whatsoever to a homophobic society is going to put you even further out on the fringes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So true or not, the idea of the alien anal probe has become part of the American UFO culture. It's been featured in popular media um, with mentions on programs from ranging from the X-Files to Supernatural and South Park. They're all funnier and shit. (laughs) <laughs> they were pretty funny, actually. Um, that's actually South Park's premiere episode is Cartman being anal probed. And it's <laughs> it's pretty funny if you haven't seen it. <laughs> it's kind of horrifying because, you know, you have to remember that Cartman is like eight. But, you know, still, he's an asshole. So it kind of has it coming. Um, it's the, the idea. It's a joke. I mean, obviously, we laugh about it a lot. And we've learned to sort of roll with it and make fun of it. But speaking as a woman, the idea of that kind of violation really hits home. And so if it's something that is happening to people, then my sympathies, absolutely. But honestly, if you're just making it out to get attention, fuck you, it's funny. I'm going to laugh at you. (laughs) But um, there have been women as well who have claimed not so much anal probing, but vaginal probing and even involuntary pregnancy. Yeah, I've heard a whole bunch of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's something that I'd like to cover later on. It's Mm. a pretty sensitive topic, but... Then the aliens doing the women and vice versa and all kinds of crap. Yeah, yeah, little alien babies running around. Mm. There's um, even some theories that the leap in human evolution that happened about 250,000 years ago has to do with the introduction of alien DNA. Hey, baby. <laughs> well, you know, when it's it's kind of interesting because when you look at ancient myths and legends, we constantly, especially in Greek mythology, the Greek gods were, they fucked everything. Yep. Literally everything. I mean, centaurs, minotaurs, <laughs> all of these exist, mermaids, because the gods screwed something that wasn't even remotely human and created these bizarre hybrid creatures and ancient astronaut theorists believe (laughs) this could be you know the the introduction of alien dna could be where some of these myths come from so whether you believe it or not um whether you believe in alien anal probing or not (laughs) that's kind of where the story began with um, Barney Hill's violation in 1961. Anal probing. And it's continued through the modern day. You got to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is our only episode. I got to say it. <laughs> All right. Say it one more time and then we're going to say goodbye. Anal probe. <laughs> <laughs> so those were um, 
those were the three most famous stories that I found. There are dozens more. Oh, yeah. And, but like I said, it's interesting to me that they started out never, stories of alien abduction never, never, never mentioned that sort of violation um, until Mississippi and then he started hearing it a little bit more. And then after Whitley Strieber's book came out, suddenly it was every other story involves some sort of violating probe. So I, I do think that there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence for if this is happening, that it's something either we're more comfortable talking about or people are embellishing their abduction stories with popular information well it's also kind of like when a child molester is molesting all these kids and then that one kid's brave enough to talk about it Mm -hmm. and then all the other kids say hey he molested me too that could be something kind of like that i mean once somebody says something then they all say hey it happened to me too so you think it's a possibility that this is something that's been happening, but it wasn't until somebody had the courage to say it out loud that other people were willing to come forward and say, okay, well, it wasn't just me. Well, it happens, you know. And then you also got people just want to, anything to be famous about, you know, get attention or whatever. Yeah, I mean. You got lots of those, of course. So. Yep. And I think that's that's unfortunate because... If this is happening to people and you're coming forward with some false story that's shedding doubt on the testimony of others who are genuinely traumatized by something that actually happened to them, then fuck you. Yeah. I hope something does abduct you and probe you. (laughs) But if this really happened to you and you had the courage to speak out and say, look, there's something out there then bravo. I don't know that I'd want to talk about it. Yeah, I, there's no way. i talk to you, but yeah, I wouldn't I, talk to a bunch of people and go on TV or radio or whatever. Fuck that, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I have, I, I have absolutely no desire to be famous. Except on the podcast, you know. Tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah, no, I, I've, I, I don't, I don't want to be on TV. I don't want to be interviewed, being, you know, talking to people about how somebody stuck something up my butt, <laughs> or anywhere else for that matter. You're more than welcome to use your imagination. Keep that shit to yourself. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are people out there who are remarkably selfish. Um, yeah. I don't get it. But so anyway, that you wanted to know about aliens and anal probes and where the stories came from. And there you have it, a brief 30 minute synopsis of why we started talking (laughs) about aliens and butt plugs. So with fidget spinners on them. (laughs) (laughs) I saw one with a fidget spinner. (laughs) I'm not telling you where I saw it, folks. Okay. Anyway. So if you have any stories that you would like to share with our audience or would like to, for us to read on the air, whether they be alien anal probes or not, please come over to our website at www.weirdasfck.com and scroll to the bottom, hit our contact form and send us your information. We'd love to hear from you. And like us and join our club. We don't have a club. Well, you know, <laughs> you sign up. I forget the damn word for you signing up for a, to watch us all the time i forget what the word subscribe is. subscribe to us yes <laughs> <laughs> subscribe to us more f- subscribe to <laughs> my god english i speak it i promise <laughs> yes if you want more delightful content subscribe <laughs> <laughs> bye <laughs> bye <laughs> Want to stay connected between shows? You can find us on Instagram at Weird as FCK Podcast, on Twitter at Weird as Fuck Pod One, on Facebook at Weird as FCK Podcast. Send us an email at Weird as FCK Podcast at gmail.com 
or come on over to our website at www.weirdasfck.com. There you can check out our blog, pick up some merch, look over our sources, and even share your weird experiences. You might even make it on a future episode. We would love to hear from you. Until then, tune in and keep it weird.